Sri Vishnu Sahasranam, name 769, Naika Shringa. Naika is a fairly common conjunction, na eka, not one. Uh, we also have common word in Bengali, which is directly taken from Sanskrit, onik or aneka, not one, which uh, is generally used in Bengali not to mean two, three, four, but to mean many. So the so not one and shringa. Shringa is translated in various ways. Not one shringa or many shringas. Um, and this is another nasty name, if you like, or not nasty. All the names of Vishnu are blissful and uplifting. There's nothing nasty about them. But it's another name in connection with what the enemies of Krishna and the devotees seeing as see as being nasty. And this is more connected with the uh, rasas like uh, Bhibhatsa and Bhayanaka, the, the Bhibhatsa that of uh, disgust or horror and Bhayanaka is fear. So, um, and of course with Viraras, which can be there in uh, it can be there for fighting the enemies. It can be there in, in Sakyaras. It can be there in Madhuras. But this name, we can, it, it's another name connected with Krishna's violence, his blissful violence. So the, the root that um, most of the com or many of the commentators take is uh, derives and it, yeah comes out to be himsayam. So that word, at least the word ahimsa, non-violence, has become well known in English, courtesy of Mahatma Gandhi. So the opposite of that is hingsa, violence. So particularly the meaning is given here himsayam to tear to pieces, to kill, to hurt. And others, uh, another meaning, means of destruction. And we all, and other meanings given are radiance and a means for protection against obstacles from others, which again comes out as violence. And there is another meaning, which I'll get to later. So, uh, Sri Parasha Bhatta, combining the meanings of previous names with this name to bring out, or rather, to bring out the meaning of this name, and uh, again explaining this, explaining this in terms of Krishna, especially Krishna at Kurukshetra. He uh, uses the term to explain this name, Hingsa Sadhanam, the means by which Krishna hurt others or was violent to others. And he takes this to be na eka, not, not just one means of causing distress to his enemies, but many means. He had various, Krishna had various ways, and Parashabhata elucidates this by bringing out instances from the Mahabharata, the various ways in which Krishna brought about the destruction of the enemies of the Pandavas. And uh, examples given, well, giving good advice, is famously, most famously to Arjuna, but also the, the, the Pandava leaders would have a council of war before the war, and then every night after each battle. And Krishna was always present with them, giving good advice. And of course, most famously, Krishna gave good advice to Arjuna to fight. Uh, 
without which it would have been a different story altogether. It's unimaginable now, but Arjuna was serious about not fighting, and Krishna convinced Arjuna, who was himself convinced that Krishna should listen to him and take his own advice, he turned around the mind of Arjuna and gave him good advice, which really made a lot of difference. Uh, Krishna very skillfully driving the chariot to be a charioteer for, uh, well, to be a charioteer anyway requires skill, but in a battle to avoid how to drive in such a way zigzag to avoid the, or to, or to make it more difficult for the opposing enemies to hit you or even to track you down. <clears throat> uh, seeing, maybe seeing a, a break in the, um, in the enemy army's formation and just seeing that little chink getting in there and so on, this great skill, military chariot driving. Lost now, no doubt. Can be revived also. Then another means Krishna used was bluffing, <laughs> saying that he wouldn't use a weapon. He wouldn't lift any weapon in the fight. Well, that was not uh, premeditated. And in one sense, he didn't really use a weapon in the sense that the wheel of a chariot is not usually considered a weapon. So these are some examples. These are some examples that Parasha Bhatta gave, and one that comes to my mind in this regard is his uh, inter his making it appear as if the sun had set giving great delight to the Kauravas because they thought that now Arjuna would have to kill himself. But in fact, it was the Sudarshan Chakra which usually gives great light covering the sun to make it look as if it had set. And in the meantime, uh, Arjuna continued his, his journey toward Jara, uh, Jirasa, no, it's not Jirasa, and the, toward, what's his name? The, Jayadrata, toward Jayadrata, and came close, came within about a couple of miles, and that was enough distance for him to shoot an arrow and lop off the head in the, with the sun still not set. So Krishna, he did all kinds of things all kinds of ways, not just one, not Ekashringa, not just one means to be violent. And Balade Vidyabhushan gives almost the same meaning. He, he has multiple, multiple ways to annihilate Arjuna's enemies. Uh, Parashra Bhatta uses the meaning of the name to annihilate the enemies in general, but then he gives the example of Krishna in the Mahabharata and Balade Vidyabhushan. Um, he specifically says to annihilate Arjuna's enemies. And there are all kinds of ways. Yes, I, I mistakenly, to my mind, came Jarasandha. And that was, that was quite amazing, the means that Krishna adopted. This time taking advice from uh, Uddhava, to, uh, but then how they, how they went, Krishna, Bhima, and Arjuna dressed as brahmanas, challenging for a battle, and ultimately, after 30 days of intense fighting, uh, Krishna gave a hint, which he could have done on the first day, but he also likes to watch a good wrestling match. Uh, and in this way, he actually glorified Jarasandha, because Jarasandha had to be killed, but Krishna just gave him that honor of killing him in a, uh, via Bhima, killing Jarasandha in a very unusual way. This, if we say Shringa means a means for inflicting injury, this is really unique. Uh, only, only Krishna could have thought of that or, or, uh, or had, oh, yeah, only Krishna could have thought of that. 
And so that's, that's another example of how he does his nasty killing business, sometimes through others. Now, Shringa, I, one of the meanings I didn't give, but it's a, a very common meaning of the word Shringa is horn. So what does this mean? Who has more than one horn? Actually, if we say Nika Shringa, if we say it's not one, it could also mean zero horns. Or maybe you could say not point... 0 0.79 horns, although well, that's a bit strange. Sometimes you see people cut the horns of cows partially and let them have part of their horn. Uh, what does that mean? Well, there is one horned, Varahadev. Varahadev appeared with one horn but which which avatar has more or or less than one? Many many horns. Let's think. I, I was thinking, what what could that be when I saw the name? Actually, I know the name Nika Shringa from way way back because uh, Jai Pitaka Maharaj gave that name to one of his Malaysian disciples, so I knew him from the 1980s. So I, I knew the name, and I, I knew the meaning, but I never really thought about it that much. Which, which avatar has more than one horn? And when we think about it, uh, well, we think about it, and we don't know. Two-horned rhinoceros avatar? I'd never heard of that one. Anyway, we get the answer. From Shankara, Shankara Acharya says, one meaning of the word horn is the Vedas. Now you may say, well, in that case, Shringa just directly translates to Veda. And it doesn't mean horn at all. But no, there is an instance in the Rig Veda where... There is a description of the uh, there is a description, yeah, Chatvari Shringa, four horns, Trayasya Pada, three legs, Dveshirshe, two heads, Sapta Hasta Sosya, and uh, seven hands. So it goes on to explain. Um, that the four horns referred to here, this is from the Rig Veda, it's, uh, it's Parokshavada, it's indirect, indirect description, that the four horns refer to the four Vedas, the three feet refer to the three daily sacrifices, and so on. So in this way, the Supreme Lord is described in this way. And the four ho it's four horns, but the four horns means the four Vedas are of him. And we'll find in upcoming com an upcoming name quite soon is Chatur Veda Vit, he who knows the four Vedas. Oh, gave it away. Well, there's a lot to say. Uh, now, another meaning given is that he can be controlled or reached with the four horns of pranav. Pranav means omka. Omka, yeah. They're, they're in the, pranav, pranav is the word which indicates the sacred syllable Om. Parnava Sarva Vedeshu, we find in Bhagavad Gita. In the uh, Vedas, Krishna says, he is represented by Pranav, the most sacred syllable in the Vedas. So there are four horns, the 
or the, or the four elements, which are aka, uka, maka, and nada. In other words, om is pronounced a, u, ma. When these three syllables are joined together, a, u, ma, then we get a, then we get aum. Oh, it's written in English a, u, m. And in Sanskrit, it has its own syllable, at least if it's written in the Devanagari script, and in, in every, in Tamil script and every script. And so what's nada? Nada means the sound, continuing sound. Nada is, is there's a whole science of nada, which is uh, s briefly described toward the end of Bhagavatam. The, the mystic science of sound. And nada is that sound which, in this context, is the sound which remains. So in one chance, om. That continuing sound at the end is nada. So these are a, o, ma, and the continuing sound. So the, he can be reached through Omka. And in Kali Yuga especially, because there are so many requirements to be able to properly chant Omka. One even to be qualified to chant it, one has to be initiated into it, and there are, there are very many strictures. One has to be really a pure Brahmana, which is not possible in this age. So all the results of chanting Omka are attainable by people with no previous qualifications by chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. That's a big topic in itself. Uh, Shringa also gives the idea of uh, lordship, overlordship, supremacy, and <clears throat> this name can refer to many aspects of the many, if not most, if not all of the aspects of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is an absolutely huge subject. Uh, just to explain the different aspects of the godliness of God, or the godness, that's a better word, godness of God, what makes him God, is a huge topic, which is the subject of all the Vedas, all the Rishis, uh, since time immemorial, summarized in Vishnu Sahasranama. So in, instead of trying to elaborate on what is, what are the all the different qualities that make him God, we can just say, well, that's why we're doing a series of talks on Vishnu Sahasranama. And the essence of his godness Madhurja Bhagavata Sa, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Krishnadas Kaviraj in Chaitanya Charitamrita says that sweetness, divine sweetness, is the essence of his godness. Another meaning of the name Naika Shringa, he has many aspects of his role as a bestower of his devotees' wishes. In other words, in many ways, he uh, fulfills the desires of his devotees. Devotees basically have one desire, to serve Krishna, but that may be expressed in various ways. As we see, for instance, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu offered boons to all his devotees when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was sitting on the throne with his manifesting his opulence as Vishnu. He was sitting on the throne in the house, the, the, in, the, in the puja room. He was sitting on the singhasana or the, the place of worship of, of Vishnu. He was sitting in the house of Sri Vashtako and showing himself to be the Supreme Lord and calling all his devotees one by one, praising their qualities, and then saying, what boon do you want? And each devotee would say something different. They're all devotees, but someone would say, may I serve my guru life after life? May I have 
uh, complete devotion to your lotus feet. Uh, Sridhara, the poor banana leaf seller, poor means indigent, poverty stricken. He said, may I life after life fight with that, continue to fight with that Brahmin boy who comes and tries to steal away my produce. <laughs> you have to know Chaitanya Bhagavat to know that because that, that boy was none other than Nimai Pandit himself. So in various ways he fulfills their desires. Uh, this is stated by Satya Sanda Yatir Raj that uh, he, in multiple forms, in various ways, he, uh, he, another way, another way is that he establishes dharma in various ways. And that we see in the different avatars. They all come, uh, dharma samsthapanata, for, for re-establishing dharma. But they do so in various ways. By protecting the Vedas, we have the, among the ten avatars, the, the first is, Matsya, who protects the Vedas, and Hayagriva also uh, protects the Vedas. So there's no dharma without the Vedas. Uh, <clears throat> dharma is established in the Vedas. Uh, and then he, by, particularly by Vinashayata uh, Dushkritam, that is the visible, or most prominently visible way in which the Supreme Lord establishes dharma by clearing, just doing some weeding, uh, weeding the land of all the undesirable elements. So that's prominent in so many different avatars. And another meaning that Satyasanda Yati Raj gives of is uh, a different way of looking at it altogether. Na, na Ekashringa. I said before that Varaha has one horn. Who is the avatar with many horns who can fit the name Naika Shringa? Well, the name Naika Shringa, this. Uh, what is his name? Satyasanda Yati Ranji. It then. He. It. it Naika Shringa refers to Varaha, but we just said he only has one horn. Ah, but then Satya Sanda Yati Raj, giving another, he, giving another interpretation to the name, says Na Eka Shringa, in which Na refers to the Parama Purushatvam, the supreme personality ness of the Supreme Personality, Bhagavan, and then Eka Shringa. So he is the Supreme Lord with one horn, which means Varaha Dev. And he quotes Moksha Dharma from the uh, Mahabharat. Eka Shringa Tato Bhutva Varaho Nandi Vardhanaha Imam Cha Udritvat Bhumi Meka Shringaha. So twice in this verse. This uh, Eka Shringa comes up. Which means that previously in the, in the, in the narration. Oh no, actually there are two versions of this verse here. One has Eka Shringa Tato Bhutva. Uh, which means there, thereafter, with one horn, Varaha, uh, and in the other one, Ekashringa, Ekashringhaf Pura Bhutva. Previously, in earlier times, uh, so there are different recensions. But anyway, the meaning is with one horn, the avatar Varaha brought the earth back to her original position by lifting her on his horn, which doesn't mean he, he 
nicked her with the horn, but was resting on the horn. Then Satyadeva Varshishta uses the meaning completely different interpretation and takes Shringa to mean Deepti, who is effulgent. <clears throat> so uh, effulgent, we just had a whole discussion of that a few names ago, Duty Dhar. Who, um, so, all right. <laughs> but Satyadeva Vashishta also gives the meaning. He who has many ways of causing hingsa, that's already given. And also he who provides many ways to protect from himsa. So the two things are interlinked. Just like in Britain, they refer to what might more uh, realistically be called the minister of war, ministry of war and ministry of violence is euphemistically called the defense ministry. And that has been adopted in India and maybe other countries that adopted the British parliamentary system after uh, being released from British political rule. So the two things are interlinked. You may attack someone and it's violence. But if you defend from violence, you also, generally violence is required. And Satyadeva Vashishta, as often he does, sees and conveys to his readers the role of the Supreme Lord within the creation and the name Naika Shringa to mean he gives many ways to ward off danger. He gives the example how the Supreme Lord has given different creatures various instruments, you could say, or, or not exactly weapons in the sense that they're fashioned. A weapon is fashioned by man, but just like, for instance, the lion's claws and teeth are his weapons which are fashioned by God. Now, you may say, well, he uses that for attack. Yeah, that's true, but he also uses it for a defense. The, the many animals have horns which can be used for defense and for attack. But many, many animals, just they, they have horns, just like the cow or the buffalo. They're, they're used for uh, defense or in the male of the species, they, they may also use them for attack. But that would be mostly attack, just like just, what, two days ago in the field I saw, just behind where I'm staying, two rams. They're butting each other's heads. They're attacking each other. So they back off and then zoom, give, give each other a, a good, uh, with their horns, give each other a good headbutt. And that went on for some time. So I, I suppose that was showing for showing who's supreme. I don't know all the, the, by the, the biological or the psychology of sheep or whatever, someone who studied, they may be able to tell us. But the point, yeah, even, even the horns of a ram are very different to those of a buffalo. And even among buffaloes, we find different kinds of horns. But the, everything is given by Krishna. The tusks of an elephant and his general body size it, it, it inspires awe among um, other animals. And Satyadeva Vashishta takes that he gives various means for defense and also various means for attack. So both are there for different animals. So that's very helpful that we can see Krishna everywhere and in everything, especially these Meanings given by Satyadeva Vashishta, they're very uh, 
helpful if we can bring them to mind. The general point is Krishna is everywhere in everything, inspiring everyone according to their previous desires, uh, inspires them in various ways. And Krishna gives every living the apparatus for fulfilling his desires and living out his karmic reactions. Everywhere is Krishna. Hare Krishna. Naika Shringa. Not one Shringa. Kijai. Mancha Kalpa Tarupyas Charkipa Sindhubi Evacha. Patita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha. Dante Nitaya Chunakang Padayo Nipatya Kritvacha Kaku Shatameta Raham Ravimi. He sadava sakala eva vihaya du rat, goranga chandra charane kuruta anurana ha. Parivada tu jano yata tata va nanu mokorona vayang vichara yama ha. Hari rasa madira madati matta bhuvi vilutama natama nirvishama. Hari Krishna, Hari Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hari Hari. Hari Rama, Hari Rama, Rama Rama, Hari Hari. A few more points about Naika Shringa. Discussion of Krishna is never finished. There's always more to say. By invoking this name, it's making a point that Krishna has more than one or many ways of protecting his devotees, uplifting his devotees. He's unpredictable. God has intelligence. That should be accepted. <laughs> and he uses his intelligence in various situations and applies his intelligence to various situations to see how to benefit his devotees. A prime example, oh, well, well, there are many examples of this. <clears throat> For instance, when Krishna's cowherd boyfriends entered the mouth of Aghasura, Krishna had to think. Now, how am I going to save them? They already entered his mouth. If I kill him and then his mouth closes and then they'll all be stuck inside. So Krishna himself went inside the mouth and killed him from inside and kept his mouth open. That's just one example. Uh, he sometimes takes advice from Uddhava. Uh, for instance, when... <coughs> Yudhishthira Maharaj proposed performing a Raja Suya Yagya. And the news came to Krishna, and Krishna discussed with his intimate advisors, prominent or Pradhan, the Pramukh, what was the word? Number one, among whom was uh, Uddhava. And they, dis they were discussing that, well, can't really do it as long as Jara Sandha's there. So we have to think of some way of killing Jara Sandha, getting him out of the way. And that's the only way to get him out of the way. It is not, I, theoretically, you could go and speak Bhagavad Gita to him and tell him, Savadhaman Paritaja Mame Kam Sharanang Braja, but he's not interested to listen. He doesn't think Krishna's worth hearing from. He's a demon. He thinks Ishvaroham, I'm the supreme controller. So, <clears throat> Jurasana had to be killed. And at that point, Krishna didn't want to kill all his armies at that point. And he also wanted to um, release the kings who were imprisoned by Jurasana. And he wanted to show them mercy, so he personally went there. And it's a whole scheme how he did that. So. The point I'm making is that Krishna, he's not stereotyped. He can, he can think up new ways to benefit his devotees. He can think of things which no one else would think of. 
uh, Arjuna didn't say to Krishna, Krishna, why don't you throw the Sudarshan chakra to cover the sun and make everyone think that the sun has set? And in the meantime, we'll go on charging forward, getting closer to Jayadrata. Arjuna didn't suggest it. Krishna thought that uh, that's really novel. That's unprecedented in the history of anything. Now Krishna, he has many ways to uplift his devotees, and more are coming. <laughs> Who would have thought that Krishna would ar arrange that Indian people would become inspired by about Krishna consciousness by being preached to it, being, being preached to about it by people from Lecha and Yavana backgrounds like myself. Who could have imagined it's Krishna's play, Krishna's pastimes? I'm not saying I'm part of Krishna's pastimes, but I'm part of that overall scheme. It's the ongoing mercy flow of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which by Srila Prabhupada's mercy, I and so many others are participating in, allowed to participate in. Another point to take from the name Naika Shringa is that God has horns. Now, people who believe in Satan are really going to take exception to this. Uh, once on the streets in Dublin, just, just outside the main post office where I was distributing Sri Isha Upanishad for several months, sometime in the 1970s. <clears throat> A Catholic priest came out to me and saw that, and there's the picture of Vishnu with the snakes of Ananda Shesh, the hood showing. He said, that's Satan. Snakes, Satan. So similarly, it's considered horns. If you go horns, a human, if they have horns, that's a sign of Satan, the, the very personification of evil. And they might cite this. Maybe, maybe the evangelical Christians who are busy blaspheming Hindu religion as part of their campaign to convert everyone to their version of Christianity, which is questionable if it's Christ's question version of Christianity, but uh, they don't have any doubts about it. So they, they, they would love that. Really? You, you have a God with horns? Really? That means it's Satan. Of course, if we see historically, the whole idea of Satan predated Christianity and was linked with the prototype Zoroastrian religion, which is now Parsi religion in India. There are so many things. If we look at the historical roots of Christianity, it's a lot of it comes out of what they later rejected as paganism. So we worship a God with horns, but a horn doesn't necessarily make you evil. Maybe they should stop eating animals who have the animals with horns like sh well rams and cows, maybe on that basis. Does it make them evil because they have horns? Does it make you evil because you eat that? Uh, <clears throat> practically, if we take the words of Jesus to not worship mammon, then speaking objectively, I hope, most Christians today appear to be more worshippers of mammon than of God. It's hard to find a Christian who has the spirit to leave everything behind him and follow me, as Jesus said to the fishermen. 
headed by Peter, was it not? I, I don't pretend to be a biblical scholar, but no, I remember a few things from my childhood and later. Um, it's hard to find. There are the, the Jehovah's Witnesses. They do that. When you, when you become a Jehovah's Witness, then you leave everything and become a, a preacher. That's generally what you're supposed to do. Anyway, uh, it's there in all religions. Uh, the, the great teachers like Jesus and Buddha come and then people take their teachings and they accept what they like and twist what they don't like to fit their own ideas of what they think God should be or how we should practice religion. But real religion means to act according to his desire and to accept that he is independent, God is independent, and he lives and exists and does everything as he likes according to his desire and not according to what we think he should be. Christians in India are also on the war path about Christ is very moral and Krishna is not very moral. <laughs> I could discuss that, but it would be hard because they don't really want to listen and the, the preconceived notions of what God should be. But we should try to understand him as he is and not according to our anthropomorphic ideas by which they make Jesus into God we accept him as a messenger of God, but to be, to be directly God, the creator, maintainer, and destroyer of the worlds, I, I, it doesn't seem that Jesus himself said that. Uh, there are others who want to convert the, pers the, the, the personality of Godhead into something formless. It's, and then you don't have any problem with morals or anything else if God is has no form and no personality. Uh, he, he doesn't have any form and personality, but I go to heaven, which is a sensuous paradise, and he, although he's a formless, for me, he generates unlimited virgins. This is the Islamic understanding, as we have heard it. Uh, it and generates unlimited virgins for me to enjoy, but he's just some vaporous cloud or something. And I, I enjoy it. So his, I go to heaven and then I enjoy the... And what a concept. <laughs> he, he generates virgins. They're, they're, he generates living beings just so I can enjoy them one after the other. It's, it's not, a, not a very high level concept of God. I, there's no, no real concept of submission to him. Well, Islam means submission to him, but it's submission to him. Okay, I'll do what you say, but when I die, I'm going to enjoy virgins. There are so many problems with such theologies. If you really want to know God, come here, read Srila Prabhupada's books. You can listen to this series of talks on Vishnu Sahasranam. Actually, this series of talks is not so much as, well, it is establishing the position of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, uh, not in a systematic way, but it takes some basic piety to understand. It's not simply with the brain that we can understand, some basic piety. And what's blocking most people from accepting, actually, the very high level and very developed, developed understanding of Krishna as the Supreme Personality of Godhead is really very, what we could say, high-class theism, even from the intellectual point of view, but even from the more so, most importantly, from the devotional perspective. What prevents most people is, you can put it down to insincerity, though they may not have been exposed to it, but also people's concept whether they say they believe in God or they say they don't believe in God or they don't know or they don't care, most people think we're here to enjoy this world. 
and heaven we go there by the grace of God and we enjoy there the the, the notion of that we are meant to serve him is very strong in Vaishnavism, very strong and clear, which is the way it should be. And you can't really understand, can't really have a discussion about or really understand anything deeply and seriously about God with people who have such crippled concepts that he facilitates our enjoyment. He who doesn't really do much or, or is just some vapor or some undefined voice in a cave or uh, then uh, it's very difficult to even discuss. Even the people may be very deeply committed to God. They, even they're ready to fight and kill each other, and they've done for generations. They'll fight and kill each other over their differing concepts of God. But they they don't really want to know him as he is, it's th they want to use him. I, God will, I'll, I'll worship God and then he'll do this for me. So, okay, I'm willing to even give my life with the faith that I will enjoy myself in heaven thereafter. So it's, it's almost as if they want to keep the concept of God very vague that you can't know him fully, so don't even bother. Just get busy enjoying those virgins. Ah, so he comes to show himself as he is. He comes. And then also say, it's not possible for God to come. Then he's just an ordinary human being. How can you call an ordinary human being God? Uh, but even when he comes himself, maya javanika chanam, <laughs> being covered by the covering of maya agyad hoksajam avyayam nalakshase muhadrisha narto nart yadharo yata the covering of his illusory potency covers krishna from those who don't want to see him as he is and what what do they see they they see something but they don't understand who he is they don't understand that he is visible to their eyes, but he's higher than simply what they can see with their eyes. Therefore, adhokshaja. Because agya, they don't know. They didn't hear about Krishna from proper authorities. That He's not an ordinary human being. He's avyaya. He's eternal and uh, undeteriorating. So therefore, they see him but they don't nalaksha, they don't, they don't notice him, or they, they don't properly visualize his form, because mudha drusha, they see through the eyes of their foolishness. So what do they see? It's like someone seeing an actor on a stage. They don't really understand who the real person is it is. They mistake him for, they identify the person to be the role he's playing. They think this is Romeo in a presentation of Romeo and Juliet. Oh, he's not Romeo. 